Okay, good. All right. So thank you everyone for joining us. If we can open up our Bibles to Matthew chapter 21. I really, because I leave my, my leather bound Bible in my office. Um, so I'm looking at my computer. It feels weird. I usually try to remember to bring everything home, but. Matthew 21. Matthew 21, and we're going to be looking at uh, verse 23 to verse 32. share my screen too. We could look at it together. Okay. So verse 22, I'll read verse 23 to 27. Um, when he entered the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came to him as he was teaching and said, By what authority are you doing these things, and who gave you this authority? Jesus said to them, I will also ask you one question. If you could tell me the answer, then I will also tell you by what authority I am doing these things. Did the baptism of John come from heaven, or was it of human origin? And they argued with one another, If we say from heaven, he will say to us, Why then did you not believe him? But if we say of human origin... We are afraid of the crowd, for all regard John as a prophet. So they answered Jesus, we do not know. And he said to them, neither will I tell you by what authority I'm doing these things. Okay, so this is, um, this is kind of a, a tense part. It's getting to be a really tense relationship between Jesus and the religious leaders. I'm going to share my screen. Hold on. I'm going to share my desktop. Um, <clears throat> We're going to look at the PowerPoints. Okay. So I think it's been a while. Um, basically, for the last few chapters, Jesus has been traveling to Jerusalem. So if you remember back in chapter 15, where he um, he casted the he he a uh, Canaanite woman. Uh, uh, a Canaanite woman came up to him when he was in Tyre and Sidon, and she said, please heal my daughter. She is demon-possessed. And he said, you know, um, it's not right to give food to the dogs, right? Kind of, a, kind of seeing, you know, how she's going to respond. Um, so that whole, and then he ends up, because of her faith, he ends up healing her daughter. But that's all the way in Tyre and Sidon. So that's way up north. If you see this far dot up here, that's in chapter 15. Um, and then I was trying to find a map of Jesus's journeys to Jerusalem, according to the book of Matthew, because every, every book has kind of a different order of, of mapping, um, but I couldn't find one. So I just had to just put this map here. And then going from that point, we see in chapter 16, uh, he goes to Caesarea Philippi, and that's right up here. So he's, Tyre and Sidon is up here, this area. He goes to Caesarea Philippi, a little bit west. And then he goes down to Capernaum, which is actually, I don't see it here, but it's somewhere in this area. It's up north. And then he leaves this whole Galilee region and he travels down. He starts traveling down to uh, Judea. So Judea is the southern kingdom. It's the southern uh, part of Israel, and that's where Jerusalem is. So most of Jesus's ministry, he's up in Nazareth, which is up here, right? And he's and he's uh, doing his ministry in Galilee. That's why we're constantly hearing and talking about the Sea of Galilee. But his um, he really needs to go down to Jerusalem. And this is where the temple is. This is where all the religious leaders are. This is where uh, all the decision-making things happen according to the religious leaders of the Jewish people. That's all in Judea. Um, and Galilee is up north, and it's divided by Samaria, 
right, which is that land, the Samaritans, right, those, those outcasted people. And this area is really a product of um, the Babylonian invasion. After they get dispersed, they come back. But what, what happened was there were all these people that came back to Samaria that brought their, their religions from their, where they were before. So they kind of practiced like a mix of different religions and they worshiped uh, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And this, is, this makes them an outcast to everybody else. So Jesus is, is doing ministry up here for a while and he's doing, you know, he, he does visit some uh, Samaritan villages and then he comes down here to, he starts traveling down to Judea. And then when he travels, we know the story. He, you know, finally the word of everything that Jesus had been doing in his ministry, you know, the miracles and everything that people have been saying, um, they are, you know, they are believing that Jesus is the prophesied Messiah. So they have, you know, what we celebrate on Palm Sunday, right? The triumphal entry, mm -hmm. you know, they start cheering and saying, you know, Jesus you are, you know, Hosanna to the son of David. Um, and we know that, you know, these are palm branches that represent victory. So, you know, back in the day when people would come back from war, they would wave the palm branches saying, we've won the war. So what they were really saying was a very, it was a very strong political statement. It was a very strong political and religious statement, right? And, and uh, Politics and religion were almost like were one back in the day. Um, but they're saying, we believe you are the son of David. You are the prophesied Messiah. And they're cheering him and all these things. Um, so not too long after that, he enters the temple. So this was actually a model of the temple that was mm -hmm. done. Um, it was, it's like a rendering of the temple, uh, kind of like a, it, I think this whole thing is like half of a football field long it's it's i think it's in a museum in jerusalem but it's huge and they made this artificial first century uh village of your uh, first century uh, jerusalem right model so they believe it the structure looks something like this so this middle thing this is the actual temple and this red roof over here this is where they um this is where the money changers were so if you, you know, I'm sure you've heard many stories or many sermons on, you know, why Jesus gets so angry. And part of that is because they kept animals in this, uh, this red area. And what would happen is when people are traveling from all over, you know, the Middle East to come to Jerusalem for the Passover, they had to bring an, an appropriate animal for sacrifice. Well, they're not going to bring like you know, a lamb all the way, you know, traveling miles because from the Levitical law, every sacrifice brought to God had to be unblemished. It had to be clean. It had to be, you know, if, if it couldn't have a bruise, it couldn't have anything. So um, in order to purchase a sacrifice, they would have to go through these money changers and they would buy the sacrifice there. The problem with this system was that a lot of people, they cheated the people um, so instead of, you know, if they're changing, first of all, they're changing a currency because they're coming from all over the Middle East. The currency is all different, right? So they, they're they changing the currency and in that process, they get cheated. And then they're buying a sacrifice. Um, in that process, they get cheated because they're being like grossly overcharged. It's like buying food at the airport, right? Because like people have no choice but to buy what's there. Um, they're grossly overcharged. So people who are poor, people who might wanted, they, they wanted to worship, they wanted to offer a sacrifice. They couldn't do that because they didn't have the money because it was, they were charging an exorbitant amount uh, to be able to, to sacrifice here. And um, in more recent studies, one of the things that uh, different scholars are saying is that in the first century, um, as you can see, this is a big building, right? So rich people, uh, people who owned a lot of gold, um, a lot of wealth, they would actually store their wealth in the temple. And what would happen is they would leave it here because it's very secure. And so the temple is sitting on a lot of this money. And not only that, every Jewish male had to give a half shekel tax to the temple. So that's how, like, if you think about it, 
how poor these people were and how they lived on like subsistence uh, industries. You know, they were farmers, right? They were, you know, carpenters. They were, you know, doing things by trade. They were barely scraping by. Not only that, they were being taxed by the Roman government and they had to pay a large tax even to be even to set foot in the temple, even just to say that you are a Jewish person and to be connected to the temple, they're paying this large tax. Not only that, you have a lot of money stored at the temple. So what the temple would do is it would loan out the money to people. So a lot of people, um, <clears throat> they would get these loans from the temple. So people who uh, needed to pay off something for their land or they had to pay off a family member's debt or you know all these things they would, whatever it was, they would get a loan from the temple. So the temple would take the money that was being stored by the wealthy class and they would give out that money and they would charge exorbitant <coughs> interest to these people, right? Um, and this was almost, it's supposed to be like a courtesy. Like if you were Jewish, this tem the temple is doing this for you. But the problem with that is they were, pay they were charging exorbitant interest for this. So it's as you know, obviously from what I'm saying, it's more like a bank than a temple. It's, mm -hmm. it's not really a place of worship. It's not, you know, um, it's not what it was supposed to be. Um, could, and if we look back at kind of like the Old Testament history, right? The temple was always supposed to represent God's promise and God's provision. It was a, a physical sign of saying, you are my chosen people. So all throughout the Old Testament, you know, when Solomon, uh, so King David's son, when he finally built the temple, they looked at the temple thinking, oh my goodness, we were once slaves, right? We were once these vagabond people roaming, you know, uh, the desert. We were slaves in Egypt. We were roaming around. And just like many tribes, many nomadic tribes back in the day, um, they ended up in this prime real estate where the Canaanites were. And not only that, they have this glorious temple. Uh, and then they had a king that was actually very well known and very powerful, which was King David, right? So these were all the signs of God's goodness and God's faithfulness that God had chosen the Israelites. Well, you know, after the Babylonians come, they, dest uh, they destroy the temple. And everybody, you know, I think 584 uh, BC, they get destroyed, they get dispersed. They finally are brought back by a remnant and they build this temple. And that's kind of what's talked about in Ezra and Nehemiah, how they are rebuilding the temple. And it's not as beautiful. Everybody knows it's not as beautiful as Solomon's temple, right? It doesn't have, it's not as big, it's not as grand, it's not as luxurious, but it was still supposed to represent God's covenant and God's promise to Israel. Over time, uh, it's become something else. It's becoming, it becomes a machine to control people. It becomes a burden. Um, and everybody lived under fear of the temple, right? Because everybody owed money to the temple. So it was not a place of connection with God. One of the things that they say is when in 70 AD, when the Romans came and completely destroyed the temple, um, so in 70 AD, you know, uh, they surround Jerusalem, they starve out the city, so no food can go in and, and out. They invade, they take the temple, they take all of the money. But what they noticed is even before the Romans got there, the people had gone into the temple and they burned the debt records. Um, so that's really what has gotten people to be, to really study what were these debt records, because that was something that they wanted to get rid of right away. Um, and this is a really sad, very terrible tragedy because we know that we know that after the Romans came in, they took the temple, they took the money, they took Jew the Jewish people as slaves, and they, with that money, they actually built the Roman Colosseum, right? So, you know, we go there and, you know, it's like, oh, it's so beautiful, it's a grand. But if you look at the history, it's actually very tragic and very sad. So right around the time when Matthew was written, it was actually written, uh, it was actually written around the time when not shortly after the temple was uh, crushed and, you know, dispersed and, and all this was happening. Um, and Matthew, and I think that's one of the reasons why Matthew has an emphasis on, you know, 
he's very critical of Jerusalem and very critical of the religious leaders, more so than any other gospel. Um, because when it was written and when it was circulated, it's almost like hindsight is twenty twenty. All of these things, you know, Jesus had talked about and these things actually came to pass. You know, this system that was built, right, that was supposed to represent something so great and so uh, holy and sacred ends up becoming so corrupt and it ends up being destroyed. Um, so Jesus, as I said, so he goes in, he overturns the tables, he's very angry, he, you know, it's, I think it's, I don't know which version, but he whips the animals, he just, he's just so enraged at what's happening, and rightly so. Um, another thing also to, to note is that they also, you know, where they would have allowed foreigners and the stranger and, you know, the, the vulnerable to worship, they wouldn't be allowed to worship within the temple, but there were uh, places in a courtyard outside the temple. Um, so apparently where the animals were being kept, that was where, you know, that's where all the foreigners would be able to stay and offer a sacrifice and be able to worship. There was supposed to be a place allotted for that, and that's where the animal was. So a lot of scholars, they believe that, you know, they're on so many different levels, Jesus is angry because, um, you know, first of all, you know, the Torah is very explicit about not usury and not charging high interest not oppressing people uh, and taking care of the vulnerable, vulnerable, such as the widows and the orphans. Um, and it was the temple really was supposed to be a place to draw all people. It was supposed to be a place that um, was supposed to bring people from all nations to be able to understand who the God of Israel is. And all of that area is taken up by this corruption, right? And this um, this money-making scheme. So Jesus is really angry. He's really upset. And we see this, this come head to head. Uh, and this is the first time he's really arguing with the religious leaders in Jerusalem. So at, up until this point, as he's going, you know, all around, he's all going all around uh, Galilee, he's going to the Samaritan vill uh, villages, he's all the way up north. And then he, you know, he's at Tyre and Sidon. Uh, Caesarea Philippi, Capernaum, they're following him. And he has these conversations with the religious leaders, the whole journey down to Jerusalem. And now he's in Jerusalem and they are in full force wanting to trap him and wanting, wanting to trick him. So that's when, where we come to our passage where, you know, he cleanses the temple. He's very upset. Uh, you know, he curses the fig tree, right? The fig tree is a, a, an example of, the, of Jerusalem. Um, and he says, you will bear no fruit. And nobody understands what, what that <laughs> means. Um, but he's, he's talking about Jerusalem. He's talking about uh, the state of the way things are. And right shortly afterwards, he's in the temple and he's teaching. So after he's done all that, He's cursed the fig tree. He's back at the temple and he's teaching it. Everybody, you know, he just had the triumphal entry. Everybody knows who Jesus is. Everybody knows that he's a miracle mm -hmm. worker and he's done things and no one can ex explain, you know, how does he do these things? So they ask him, by what authority are you doing these things, right? And that is a really loaded question because if you look at the religious leaders, you know, the chief priests and the elders, they have the supposed authority, right? Because they are the ones taking care of the temple. They are the ones uh, running the whole, the whole show. And if you remember the way uh, we talked about it, I think maybe, maybe a month ago or so, the, the way the Pharisees worked is um, they had a tradition of the elders, right? So they have a, a leadership where it gets passed down and passed down. Um, anybody could be a Pharisee, but you had you kind of passed down your tradition one after the other. That's why earlier when the religious leaders confront, I think chapter 15, when they confront Jesus, why don't you wash your hands in keeping with the tradition of the elders? All of that tradition, that's coming out of this temple. That's coming out of something that the Pharisees decided and they said that, you know, we're going to do this. 
um, and it's a tradition that's being passed down. So the elders, uh, the chief, the people running the show, they're like, by what authority are you able to do this? Who do you think you are? Who do you think you are that you could, you know, ransack the, te the temple? And who do you think you are that you could be in the temple courts teaching? You know, you have no authority. So Jesus, in response, he, he tells them these three parables. You know, first is the parable of the two sons. Uh, second is the parable of the vineyard farmers. And third is the parable of the wedding banquet. Um, so these are the stories that he tells. The parable, uh, well, first, before that, um, so he tells the parable of the two sons. Well, okay, first he questions their authority. Uh, the religious leaders are questioning Jesus' authority, and he responds back, I will answer your question if you could tell me by what authority John the Baptist did things. Because if you think about it, John the Baptist and Jesus were very similar in that they were not given any formal authority by any official religious body, um, but they just went and they preached. And with John the Baptist, as we know, John, John the Baptist is Jesus' cousin, before Jesus started his ministry, he was going out, you know, all over and just shouting, saying, the kingdom of God has come, prepare the way of the Lord, the kingdom of God has come. And he, you know, obviously he drew a lot of attention because he's wearing like camel's fur and he's wearing locusts, he's eating locusts and honeys. He's like an aesthetic, right? He's living uh, an aesthetic. He's like a, you know, like he's, he's someone like an outlier of society, right? He's, um, he is, is not following any of the traditional norms. He's, you know, he doesn't get married, doesn't have children, not that we know of, but he just goes out and he's just preaching and preaching and he draws huge crowds of people. Um, and as we know, you know, he baptizes Jesus in the Jordan, in the Jordan river. But up until that point, he had baptized tons of people that have come to follow him and similar to jesus uh, he had a group of disciples and many people believe that john the baptist was like a modern day prophet right because if you think about you know if you read the prophets right they were very similar they were outliers they were the ones that uh you know were going off and you know preaching they would go off into the mountains and they didn't have like families and they didn't settle down like normal people of, of, the, of that culture, they were going around preaching um, and saying, God is saying this and God is saying that. And John the Baptist is the same way. And they really believe that John the Baptist was a prophet for their time to speak to the troubles of their time, just as Jeremiah was, you know, speaking against, uh, you know, the, the leaders and the people lead, bringing all these different idols uh, into Israel, just as, you know, uh, Elisha was uh, preaching against King Ahab and Jezebel, right? Every generation, every part, there's some serious issue that needs to be that, you know, the Israelites believe that there's a serious issue that God needs to address. And John the Baptist is that person for their time. He's speaking out against Herod. He was like the only person that had the strength and the courage to do so. Um, and because of that, um, as we learned, he ends up getting beheaded and thrown in jail and he ends up getting beheaded. Um, and nobody is willing to stand up against Herod, right? The, the Sadducees and the Pharisees, they, they're just, no one is really speaking out against the terrible things that he has done, except John the Baptist and he, and he ends up dying. But so people really see this connection, right, between someone like John the Baptist, that is an outlier that's preaching, that has a bunch of followers, um, and Jesus. So similar to Jesus, he's saying, well, who do you think, who, do, who gave John the Baptist authority? And the obvious answer is God, because he had no formal authority, but he drew tons of people to repentance. He drew tons of people to want to seek God, and he really prepared the way for Jesus. So the Pharisees, they don't know what to say, because if you look at the text, they're still surrounded by a crowd of people, right? They're still uh, preaching in the temple courts. So people, so they're, they're afraid. And that's really interesting because these are the people that supposedly have the authority. You know, they have this, this brick and mortar temple with hundreds of year history uh, on their back, or, you know, they ha has their back, but 
they are afraid of the people because they know that the people believe that John the Baptist was a prophet. So they say, we don't know, which is a situation that you would never think that these supposedly wise and studied rulers uh, would find themselves saying what they, they said, we don't know. And John the Baptist, uh, Jesus says, in the same way, I will not tell you by what authority I do these things. Um, so yeah, and then he goes and he tells one of the, the stories. He says there's two sons, right? Uh, the first son says, you know, he tells him to, to go work in the father's vineyard. Uh, and the first son says no, but then eventually he goes. The second, sense, the second son says, yes, I will go, but he doesn't go. And he asks the religious leaders, who did the will of the father? And obviously, it's the first son because he ended up eventually going. Well, this is very simple. Uh, it's a really short parable, very short illustration. Uh, but this parable is just after that exchange about authority. And what's obvious is that Jesus is saying that the first son are the tax collectors, the prostitutes, the outliers of society that are following Jesus and really believe that Jesus is the Messiah and are, you know, believing that and putting their faith in that. The second son are the religious leaders and the establishment because their whole lives are about, yes, I will do, you know, I will do God's will. I'll do, my whole life is about serving God. And they have the outfit that looks like it. You know, they have the official title. They are um, running the temple and they are leading the show, but really on the inside, right? They're not doing that they're not doing what God wanted. Um, and the religious leaders are obviously very angry because they know that Jesus is talking about them, right? We look at the, the passage. Jesus said to them, truly I tell you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are going into the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes believed him. And even after you saw it, you did not change your minds and believe him, right? So they're saying, he's saying, if you look at the way you treated John the Baptist, right? You had your chance to repent. You had your chance to open your heart to God, but in the end, you didn't believe him. And you did nothing when Herod arrested him and had him killed. And really, what I, what I understand about this, um, the way I interpret this, is we have to go a couple chapters ahead, right? Because this whole thing really is about, you know, why did the religious leaders, why are they the second son and not the first son, right? What is the vineyard? What is the vineyard that Jesus is talking about? Well, if we look at this chapter, this is chapter 21, and then we go to the next chapter, chapter 22, right? He continues to tell uh, these stories. He has this mm -hmm. ongoing uh, battle with the religious leaders. In verse 15, they plotted to uh, entrap him. What's interesting is that the Pharisees and the Sadducees, so the Pharisees went and plotted to entrap him in what he said. So he has this whole thing about paying taxes, right? So they're using the crowd to kind of, they're pitting the crowd against Jesus because if Jesus says, yes, you are to pay taxes and they would be really, the, the crowd would be, would be really upset. Um, <clears throat> for the sake of time, but I will, I'll, I will go into this. One of the things about this whole tax passage that's really interesting is because in the whole in the Old Testament. So what happens is um, the Pharisees they plan to tra trap him and they say, um, they "Say, teacher, we know you are sincere and teach the way of God in accordance with the truth and show deference to no one, uh, for you do not regard people with partiality. Tell us what do you think? Is it lawful to pay taxes to the emperor or not?" Right. So the ta the the taxes to the emperor was really what was causing suffering. Um, in Israel, because when the Romans, they took over any area, any territory, they taxed them to the bone so that they could barely survive. And if you look, you know, in the, if you look at Rome and you look at all the buildings and you look at all that, you know, how did they possibly in the ancient world create these majestic structures, right? It's very, it's very simple how they created that. Um, how did Emperor Nero have like 
this gigantic like Olympic size, you know, marble pool, like the ridiculous extravagant wealth. That's because every territory that the Roman government Roman Empire took over, they taxed them to the bone, right? So that was very tricky. Not only that, the the um, the coin had a, an image of the emperor on it, and as we know in the Old Testament, it's very clear about graven images, right? The Old Testament is very clear: do not worship or have anything to do with a graven image. So these graven images with the with Caesar, that was considered idol idolatry, right? That was considered uh, terrible. So this puts Jesus in a, in a, in a bind because if he says, yes, you are to pay tax, then, uh, the crowd would be very angry and say, how could you say, how could you be the Messiah? Right. How could you go against the law of Moses? If he says no, then the Pharisees and the religious leaders have every right to go to Rome and say, he's a zealot. He's, he says, don't pay the temple tax. Right. So, you know, um, so then Jesus takes the coin and says, whose image is this, right? And it's uh, the emperor's. Well, give to the emperor. What does the emperor give to God's? What is God's, right? Again, you see this, you know, he's really uh, using their own mechanisms against, against them, right? He's not, they're not able to trap him. So again, then the Sadducees come, right? And it's same thing. They, they're trying to trick him with these theological questions, right? It's this theological banter back and forth. And it says a lot that the Sadducees and the Pharisees are working together because the Pharisees were of one tribe that believed in the oral Torah, which is a whole other set of laws, uh, the Gemara and the Mishnah and the Talmud. They believed an interpretation, whole body of laws, right? The Sadducees were of an upper class, uh, you know, they were the upper class of the religious establishment, and they also controlled the temple. Um, but they were aristocratic, they were not, you know, they didn't have uh, the crowds back. But here, they hated each other, but here they're working together. So the Sadducees come, and they try to trick Jesus with a theological question, right? It's a, and it's, it's, it's not, a, it's like, one of these scenarios, right? A woman uh, marries a man with seven brothers in the afterlife. Mm -hmm. Who is his? Who is her husband, right? So she marries one and she marries another. Who is her husband, right? And this is a this is a theological trick. And I remember studying this passage in seminary. They're like, "Oh, that's cruel," you know, this poor woman. It's not about an actual person, right? It's a theological uh, way to trick someone. And Jesus says, in the next life, we will be like angels, right? It's going to be a whole different way of life, a whole different way of being, unlike this life where we marry and we, you know, have families and we create ch children and whatnot. Um, but this is theological because also this addresses whether or not Jesus believes in an afterlife. And we see that he does because the Sadducees didn't and the Pharisees did, but they were trying to trick him again and they can't, right? At the end, it says they're astounded by his teaching. Now, so the last part portion of this dialogue, this banter back and forth starts with verse 34 to verse 40, right? And I believe this is what all of this is about. You know, when Jesus is talking about the two sons from earlier, this is what the vineyard is, right? This is God's commandment. This is God's will. So they come and they try to trick Jesus again. And when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. And one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which commandment in the law is the greatest? He said to him, you shall love the Lord with all your heart and with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Right? So this whole section, this whole back and forth is really about this, is really about what was God's original intention? What was God's original word? What did he really want from the nation of Israel? And this all goes back. This is why Jesus was so angry in the temple because all, everything, the sacrifices, the temple, the worshiping God, you know, the way that they were to live really hinged on Israelite loving God with all their heart and loving their neighbor as, them, as themselves. That was, that's the greatest commandment. Now, oh, this is according to Jesus. Now, this is a really 
tricky question, right? Because I think we nowadays, because we know this, we know this passage, we could say, oh, it's simple, you know, love God and love your neighbor. But nobody really put these two commandments together the way that Jesus did, right? So if we look at, you know, if we look at the Torah, there are 613 commandments. That's a lot. And this person is a lawyer, so he studied every commandment, right? He's, he not only he's, he's a lawyer, but he's a religious leader, right? So he is articulate. He's probably studied every command. He knows the law. He knows every derivative, every different version. He probably knows, you know, all the different things that have happened in Israel, all the different precedents or, or whatever. And this is a really tricky question, right? Because, and also different religious teachers had different ways of answering this, right? Because they believe, no, it's, it's more about this command. It's more about sacrifices. It's more about uh, washing, right? It's more about, you know, every, every teacher had their own strain, their own um, interpretation of what was the most important command. So Jesus, he takes, of the 613, he takes two different passages, right? So he takes a Deuteronomy 6.5, which is the Shema, right? It's this is a, you know, they would have, everybody would have memorized this. Love the Lord your God yeah. with all your oh, yeah. heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, right? They would, and this is what, you know, the, this is what um, Moses would say, you know, put it on your doorstep when you're walking, as you're talking to your children, when you're eating and you're sleeping, and, you know, as you're traveling someplace, tell this to your children, right? It's ingrained in their minds. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. And then he takes another commandment, Leviticus 19.18. Leviticus 19.18, and he says, love your neighbor as yourself. So if we look, if we go to Leviticus 19.18, Right. If we, this is a long list. If you ever want to read, if you ever want to go to sleep, read Leviticus. It's just one <laughs> long strain of uh, commands, one after the other. Right. So, uh, Lord spoke to Moses saying, "Speak to all the congregation, right, and tell them this: when you offer a sacrifice, you do this; when you reap the harvest for your land, you do this. You do not steal." You shall not defraud. You shall, uh, you shall not render unjust. So it's on and on and on and on and on. That's what the whole book is about, right? Um, when it gets to nineteen eighteen. Oh wait, is it eighteen nineteen? I keep messing this up. Eighteen. Okay, hold on. I just miss it. 1918. Okay. Uh, so 1918, you shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against any of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. Right? So, so I think in our minds, we think, oh, of course, love God and love your neighbor. They go together, right? Like peanut butter and jelly. But actually, uh, Jesus is taking, there's 613, and Jesus is taking... One, like even the thing before this, this is you shall not hate any one of your kin. He's talking about getting along with your family. And then he, after this, he's talking about um, don't sow two different kinds of seed. Like it's like in a myriad of all different commands, he takes one from the Shema, the most important, right? Love God. And then he takes this whoop, love your neighbor, right? Um, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And if you l read Leviticus, right, there's nothing that seems to point to this verse, like it's the most important verse in the whole book. You know, it's one of the most important verses. This is just like a straw out of a pile of straws, right, seemingly. And if you were just reading through Leviticus, uh, you, you know, you, you wouldn't even notice this little line, right, that says, I didn't even notice it when I was trying to find it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But Jesus takes the Shema, and he takes this little command, and he says, out of, the, out of the haystack, it's this one. Love your neighbor as yourself. This is the most important, and he puts it together. So what I when we look at the passage, this is really what Jesus is talking about. This is why he's so upset at the uh, religious leaders, because in, in every sense, 
they're doing the complete opposite, right? And when we look at the, uh, the parable of the two sons, he's saying, you, the first son, you say you're going to do follow God's law. You say you're going to do all these things, but you don't. You are not loving God and you are not loving your neighbor, right? You're doing the complete opposite. These sinners and these tax collectors, they're repenting. Uh, these prostitutes, they, they've supposedly, you know, they've lived the sinful life according to every standard in the society of, of that day and in and, and our, our day as well. But they have repented and they want to live a different life. And they are loving God and loving their neighbor in a way that you are not. So this is what, what Jesus is saying. And, it, you know, it's funny because as they're going back and forth, this authority question, right, back and forth, uh, this ultimately shows two things. It shows that Jesus does know the law. He does know the most important thing, but he shows that his authority to stump them in the way the Jewish way of teaching things is if you can stump a student, you are the teacher because the way that you, you learned in the Jewish tradition was to ask questions over and over and over and over again. And if a teacher can stump a student, that's the, the teacher can do that because the teacher knows more and has the authority. So we see full circle. I think if you really look at chapter 21 and chapter 22, this is a section, right? Anybody reading through these two chapters and they see the back and forth banter with all these theological questions and uh, political religious questions back and forth and trying to trap him, they see that Jesus has the full authority and Jesus, uh, and has the understanding of what does all of God's law come down to, right? It's those two commands, love God and love your neighbor. <laughs> so, okay, now we get to, do you have any questions or comments? We're going to go to uh, Ephesians now. No, I think I guess I was very thorough. Yes, very informative. Okay. Okay, so if we could turn to uh, Ephesians chapter two. Verses 1 through 10. I can share it on the screen. Okay. I'm going to go grab some water. Sorry. I'll be right back. I think she needs it after all that talking. Yeah. I like your background, Nan. What? I like your background. Thank you. <laughs> Derek is uh, making me look good. Yeah. Good like, job. Uh, Amazing what they've done. Yeah. Sorry about that. I have the AC running here, and I think my voice is like drying out. That's from telling us all this good stuff. Sorry? I said that's from telling us all this good stuff. Yeah. <laughs> I guess so, yeah. Yeah, so, um, hold on. So Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. So you were dead in, you were dead through the trespasses and sins in which you once lived, following the course of this world following the ruler of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work among those who are disobedient. All of us lived among them in the passions of our flesh, following the desires of flesh and senses. And we were by nature children of wrath like everyone else. But God, who is rich in mercy, out of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead through our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, and by grace you have been saved." 
and raised up with him and seated with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the ages to come he might show immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not of your own doing, it is a gift of God, not the result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are what God has made us, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared in it beforehand to be our way of life. Okay, so this is a, um, so this passage, I'm gonna share my desktop, hold on. So this passage is, share my PowerPoint. So this passage is actually, um, so many years later, Paul is writing this, like after the fact. Um, Anytime, I, I would say definitely read Acts 19 to 20. Um, and it really has an interesting story about how Paul started in Ephesus, right? So he starts this, um, so this map, uh, this is the start of Paul's missionary journey in Antioch. As we know, there's a lot, a lot of churches named Antioch, right? This is the start of Paul's mission. And he travels all the way to the city of Ephesus. And the city had like this really, um, I found these really great, uh, this really great video on YouTube too with great pictures. Um, it's this from the Bible Project, which is a, an awesome YouTube channel. But um, so Paul started the city of Ephesus, right? And this city was a, um, there's a lot of, similar to the city of Philippi um, in, in the letter of Philippians, there's like a lot of retired, Roman soldiers, um, a very patriotic, um, extremely patriotic, very loyal to the emperor and the imperial family, um, you know, Roman citizens. And it was supposedly a very beautiful city where you had beautiful porticos and uh, images of, of gods. It was a very um, artistic kind of uh, wealthy, artistic, um, somewhat educated uh, city. And Paul, he ends up there in the beginning of his, not, yeah, not, uh, kind of in the beginning of his ministry. And uh, if you read Acts chapter 19, there, there are these people who make idols. So they make um, images of gods. So the local god that, that the city worshipped was Artemis. So, um, you know, her image is, is everywhere. And these, this one guy, Demetrius, who is this local uh, idol statue creator, you know, obviously makes a lot of money from creating her image. And, you know, after Paul comes and he starts converting all these people to Christianity, the local Artemis designers were, you know, they get very angry because they're like, they literally make a money out of, make money out of creating this, this God. And they try to drive them out of the city. Um, not only that, you know, the emperor. So the, they would say everywhere, uh, you know, uh, Caesar is a son of God, or you would have pictures of the imperial family. So Caesar Augustus would be, his image would be everywhere. And, so Paul, many years later, he's in jail, and they have, there was a church in Ephesus, and this church was growing and thriving. And what's interesting about this church is there were Jewish Christians and there were non-Jewish Christians. Um, and many of the people that lived in the city that, uh, you know, believed in all these different Greek gods and Roman gods, um, just like everyone else, they, they con converted to Christianity and they're serving as they, they're living as one body, one community. So the emphasis on this letter is really how to become one body in Christ. Because all these people, obviously, they're coming from different cultures, different backgrounds, different viewpoints of the world. Um, but when they become Christian and they say they want to be a disciple of Christ, they are a new creation. So Paul, in the first chapter of Ephesians, he's talking, he talks a lot about how, can, how are we all folded in as one body in Christ. 
And then in the second chapter, in the rest of the book, he really gets into the nitty gritty and he's almost talking to people who, it's like he's talking to people that just started their faith. And, um, and as I've said before, at this time, there's not a centralized theology. So much of what Paul is doing is he is understanding and he's, he is um, kind of creating like a systematic understanding of what did Jesus do when Jesus died on the cross? Because if you think about it, you know, this is, this is still, you know, like in the first century, right? So um, Jesus had, it wasn't too long after Jesus crucified and uh, resurrected. And Paul, if you read, you know, in Acts, he sees a vision of Jesus, right? He, he never actually had any interaction with Jesus, which is funny because he's really what brought the gospel to the world. He never had, he was never a, a disciple of Jesus. He knew Peter and had a relationship with Peter and uh, the disciples, but it's really Paul that takes the gospel all throughout. And, you know, as you could see this map, right? He really spreads it all throughout uh, Eastern Europe, uh, parts of Asia. And, um, and yeah, so he's the one who is really responsible in spreading Christianity to the world. But what Paul does is he really, he creates a systematic understanding of what is the gospel message, right? And part of that is, what did, what did, what really happened when Jesus died on the cross? And what does that mean for us as followers of Jesus, right? There is no commentary or book or, you know, set theology on understanding what is happening. But in the letters of Paul, Paul, and that's why they're in the Bible, and that's why that they're, they're canonized, it, it, because Paul really breaks it down for everybody to understand what does it mean for us to really believe in Jesus? What does it mean for our lives? And what does it mean for the afterlife? Um, and you know, one of the main things that Paul emphasizes in his letters is that it's by faith. Um, if you read Galatians and you read, um, you know, First Corinthians, right? This constant theme that keeps coming up is: uh, Do people following Jesus do they need to be circumcised? Right? This is an issue. This is a serious issue because a lot of Jewish Christians they were making a certain argument and saying, you know, if you want to be like Jesus, right? Everyone's like, yes, I want to be like Jesus. If you want to follow the ways of Jesus, yes, I want to follow the ways of Jesus, right? Well, you need to become Jewish. And becoming Jewish means getting circumcised, right? You need to follow the laws of Moses and you need to follow the ways of Jesus, right? If Jesus is the fulfillment of the Torah, you need to follow the Torah, everything in it, uh, and you need to follow Jesus. That's what some people were saying. And if you look at Paul's letters, nothing gets Paul riled up in saying that something that we're doing gives us a right relationship with God. Because Paul's thing is that after, because Christ paid the price, there is no works that we do in order to get to God. Because right? what people were saying, a lot of different teachers were saying, you do need to, you need, do need to follow some steps. You have to be circumcised. You have to follow the law of Moses. Paul makes it very clear: we are no long, longer under the law. We're no longer under the Torah. We are done with that. The Torah was there to hold the place marker for Christ. Right? When Christ came, He is the fulfillment of the law. We don't need to do the ceremonial washings. We don't need to do the sacrifices. We don't need to not eat shrimp. We don't need to not eat, you know, hoofed animals. Uh, we can eat pork, right? This is, this, is, this is what Paul is saying. So in the book of Ephesians, Paul is laying out one of the most important foundations in our understanding of our faith. Uh, in the second chapter, he he's pretty much he's talking to this church and he's talking to these people that have come from all different backgrounds and he says that you know you once worshiped all these other gods you once did all these other things you had nothing and and i think it's a it's kind of hard to understand it now because most religions i mean the religions that we the major religions that we know, think of now are 
um, monothe monotheistic religions, right? Like, you know, Christianity and Abrahamic religions, like Christianity, and then you have Islam and you have um, Judaism and, um, we, we, and then you have Buddhism, which is another huge religion. But it's much easier for us to think about, but if, if you think about the mentality back then, monotheistic religions were, there were none, right? It was a complete poly, polytheistic world. And the way that you worshiped gods was, you know, you, it was completely transactional. And that's what Paul's talking about. You worshiped all these different gods and it had nothing to do with you having a relationship with any of them. It was just, you would perform these rituals, you would perform these transactions to try to get what you want. You had no part of you that wanted to connect with, with God. You didn't really understand God, you didn't know, but now you do because of God's grace. And here, where it says, um, and by grace you have been saved, you raised us up, seated him um, in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the ages to come, he might show his imme immeasurable riches and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. So he's saying, you were like this, and now you experience the grace of Christ. You have a relationship, you're growing, you're thriving, um, you have this relationship with God. And then he goes he hits the really important point was verse eight, for by grace you have been saved through faith and this is not of your own doing, it is a gift of God, not the result of works so that no one can boast, right? So this is a really important verse for us. And this was also a central verse in the Protestant Reformation um, when Martin Luther took his theses. Can you share, can you see this PowerPoint? I might have to reshare. Hold on. Oh, I thought I had a picture of Martin Luther. Maybe I downloaded it. I didn't put it in. No. Oh, there he is. Oh, Martin Luther. So this is the, um, right? This is the one of the main verses of the Protestant Reformation, right, is because the, the Catholic Church had really institutionalized faith and they were selling indulgences and they said, you know, in order for, you know, I, I, it's a really funny, it's kind of funny. It's like the church went full circle, right? They were, they're, in the early church, there was all this confusion, you know, how do we, how do we become Christian, right? Well, we, there was all these people saying different things. And then up until 1515, right, the Catholic, the church was saying you need to buy indulgences. If you buy these indulgences, you can, you know, um, be absolved of your sins. Um, as we know now, you know, the Catholic church is no longer like that, um, far from it. But this was, this was the, the issue at the time. This is a, a verse that Martin Luther stressed, right? This is, you know, this is, it's not anything that we're doing that can, put us in right standing with God. And then when we look at Ephesians, this, this part, for what he has made us created in Christ Jesus for good works, right? So when we look at it, the, the main point of it is we were created in Christ Jesus. And out of that, we do good works, which God has prepared in advance for us to do. It's almost like, you know, God has created us, he's formed us, and he's given us a purpose, a calling, and he's going before us as we do the good works that he's prepared the way for us to do. So it's like he's created us and formed us to follow a, a certain path or a certain direction. And God has gone before us, right, preparing the way for us to do this stuff, uh, to, to live out this calling, to live out this way. And, um, and, and we need to make sure that we're understanding, right, that um, – function follows form, right? It's the fact that we are first created in Christ that gives us this intrinsic worth. We are created in God, in the image of God, and we all have a purpose and a calling. And out of that, you know, we do the good works. We follow the, the path that God has laid before us. And this is really um, an important verse in our understanding of faith. I would love to do more like a maybe a Bible study on maybe Galatians or one of Paul's letters to go more deeper into it. Um, but yeah, this is, this is, this is how, this is the crux of, 
you know, our faith that we're not doing anything to earn um, God's favor. We're not trying, we're not doing good works to, as a path to God. We are already there in God and God is going before us to help carry out the good works that he's prepared. So, so yeah, the last two passages. It's funny because I was like very emotional when I was talking about this, this, this uh, passage. And it, it's, my husband was like, because I don't actually cry a lot. <laughs> You couldn't tell by my messages, but it, my, my husband's like, I've seen you cry more just watching this virtual worship than I ever see you like cry in real life. Um, but yeah, I, I think I think in my background, right, in in the way that I was raised and in the culture that I was raised, you know, um, this is very hard for me because <laughs> it's something I, I I've. I know that no matter what I do, you know, God is, loves me, right? And I know I'm not, I can't do anything to get brownie points with God, in, you know, in that I'm not earning his love. But, um, and I know that in my heart, but I feel like it is hard um, sometimes because I, I feel like if, if I don't do, the good works, right? Then, um, then God will be upset with me or, or something like that. And I think that's, that's a struggle. And I, that's what I was talking about. It's that tension, right? And then at the, at the same time, I also take advantage of God's grace. I think, you know, we think, oh, God will forgive me. God will forgive me. God will forgive me. But then I think the point of that is when we miss out on, when we take advantage of God's grace, then we do miss out on the calling that God has for us. We do miss out on seeing God work in the world and being a part of that adventure. We miss out on having that relationship with God through that process. Um, And we're really just thinking about ourselves and we're just consumed with our own lives and what we wanna do. Um, So then we we go from taking advantage of God's grace and sometimes we, we diminish God's grace. So we really have to, I think, focus on the fact that God has created us and he's created us for a purpose and and we have to focus on the grace of God and how we don't deserve any of this but God has given us this and out of that is a love and a desire to do the things that God wants us to do so that's my understanding of it our thinking process and something like this thank you mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, I, I think it's a journey for me, right? It's a constant journey. Um, but, but yeah, when I was doing that message, I was like, oh gosh, I got to edit this. I don't want to take it out. <laughs> my mom watches my sermons too. So I was like, oh no, she's going to read about it. She's going to hear about this. <laughs> but that's great. Thank you, Pastor, for doing it. I mean, I think that's what that we need to hear that and see that from Yeah, you. yeah. yeah. I was like, I'll just leave it. Let go and let God. Let's I'll just put it up there. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, if you, um, does anyone have any questions or thoughts? It helps our thinking a lot more. It widens our thinking, I should say. You know, accepting what happens and that yeah i think also you know when you've been serving for at church right it's just and i think i think everyone here is so faithful right and has been serving for such a long time and obviously it's coming from a place of deep conviction um but i think also you know it's it's just become a part of it's definitely become a part of me so I think sometimes I need to, I think, well, I, it's hard for me too, because I'm a pastor, but I have to step back and be like, where is this coming from <laughs> sometimes? And it's, for me, I, I definitely have to reevaluate. Yeah. But because of the way things are now, we cannot get together at church, and, but it's all visual through our computers and stuff. Uh, I see things differently. I, you know, I think, um, I think. Yeah. My faith is stronger. I 
more thinking for one thing when you're in a situation like this at home at the time, you know, and, uh, you know so you, you can accept the teachings think differently, you know. Yeah. I wish more people would join us. This is really great. Yeah. I just, Pastor, I think that's why I said it's important in the way you did your sermons because it reminds us. Because I go through that almost like every day. <laughs> you know, and it's like, oh, gee, this shouldn't happen to me. Yeah. Didn't I? And I'm going, okay, Deanna, eat your humble pie, be quiet stop talking, listening to your mind and just stop and just stop and just think for a little bit but it's hard everything starts to take over and yeah you know. yeah I, I think this pandemic too is really um, I think it's really forced me to because I, uh, my personality is like, I just want to do, do, do. Like, I, there's so many things. I just want to, you know, I think I want to go out and, you know, and I want to do certain things. Like, if, if we didn't have this pandemic, I would be, I would really just knock on people's doors and just leave, like, a business card and, you know, and just introduce, you know, like, I, I, I think that there is a lot of things I would do, but because I can't do it. I feel like a lot of times I am sitting down, you know, and I'm like, oh, you know, I can't do this. But I feel like the Holy Spirit is telling me it's good. <laughs> mm -hmm. That you can't execute and, and do the things that you think, you know, that you should be doing and that you normally would be doing because this whole process, I think all of 2020 has really made me have to depend on God, you know, in ways that I don't think I would have. I think I'd be like, oh, I'm going to do this, this, I'm going to accomplish this, this, and this. But you can't really accomplish things the way that you planned in your head, right? So I think, you know, overall, I really feel like the Spirit is saying this time period is good. <laughs> And, and I don't know what that good is exactly. I just feel it. I know that God is teaching me something. Uh, maybe in 2021, I'll get the answer. And uh, I'll say it in, in a sermon or something. But, but yeah. Yeah, it's, a, it's really difficult to understand all that's going on. All the, uh, you know, especially with the political scene and uh, people who don't believe in the COVID. Hearing people talk to talk, being interviewed about why they're not masking and everything, you know, you just wonder what's going to happen. You can't help but think about it, you know, it's a year yeah. from now, so many hundreds of thousands are still going to be getting COVID and I don't know, I guess more so because I'm by myself and, you know, I talk to people and what you call, but um, I think more <laughs> about these depressing things when you listen to the news and everything and you just say, are we really gonna get out of this you know it's like and we will I'm telling myself we will but uh, anyway that's my thought <laughs> yeah yeah made, i said i think it made everybody more aware of how we just took so much for granted Yes. Mm -hmm. It's, I don't think life's ever going to be the same as it used to be. We just have to get used to it. New ways, new changes. Uh, it, it will, it'll go the way it's going to go and we just have to live with it. We're so comfy in our corner of the world and, you know, it's, hard to imagine otherwise. I get emails from my sisters and my nieces. And they aren't suffering, you know. It's now coming strong. Yeah, yeah. 
but they wouldn't, they haven't been going through what we've been going through, I don't think. Where are they living? Well, one is in Arizona. New York and Arizona? My sister's son said the best of her. She's old and mine is Oh, okay. And the other one is 87, and she lives on a farm in, in New York State. Their lives are, you know. Yeah. Different. It's normal, I guess. Yeah, I feel like a lot of the mainland is like going back. Like I see in New Jersey, the kids are at school now, and my Facebook, everybody's like, oh, first day of school, you know, and we just got an email that our kids are probably not going to go to school until January. And if they, you know, when they do, it's, it'll be like a block schedule. That's what they say. But I, every time, they, every email that says we're going to start school at this date or we're going to do this at this date, it's never like that. So I don't know. I, I have a feeling there aren't, they aren't going to go back to school uh, this year. But, but yeah, I mean, um, going back to what Lily, Lily was saying, I, I have friends that really think that this whole thing is a hoax, you know, you on know? Facebook. Yeah, I, I have friends that, that think that the people that passed would have passed anyway, and they would have passed from a flu or something. And they think that, you know, this is like the government's way of like controlling people. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, so it's funny because I, I, I have a like, you know, a, a wide group of friends and you know, I've, I've um, lived in and walked through many, you know, conservative areas. And, you know, I used to go to seminary in Hatfield, Pennsylvania. So all of those people, <laughs> you know, some areas of Pennsylvania, they, they really think it's, it's not real. And it's funny. It's just like, you know, do you, think, do you think they got raptured? I don't understand. Like 200,000 people, like, where did they, where, if you think this is not real, like, where did they go? <laughs> All the news about the hospitals being overloaded. Yeah, overloaded. No, yeah. Oh yeah. And then there are all those studies that say, you know, um, you know, in New York too, right? It's some, you know, huge amount of people that died, right? But they, mm -hmm. they look at, uh, and they're saying it's this much for COVID, right? But if you look closely, every year the death rate is a certain amount. So they said, like, I don't know, it's 30,000 people or something that, that, that they died, if, they, if you compare it to the death rate from the year before. Um, so actual COVID registered cases, that's not even accurate, right? Because who knows? Because people, you know just they died in their homes and they died you know um they don't really know if it was for sure if it was covid but if you look at the death rate from the previous year and you were to subtract that with how many people died in new york this year it's just it's literally an astronomical number but anyways but i really think this whole pandemic it really made me see how selfish people are yeah. and mm -hmm. how sinful we are just innately we're just very self-interested and self-absorbed and you know and you could be educated you could be part of you know the upper class and whatever and you could be just a, you could you could really display grave selfishness um yeah. right and and i think it's it's people think like oh if you're you know of a certain mm -hmm socioeconomic class you're more likely to do you know commit crime or do something selfish but i think this is really exposed that you know it doesn't matter what walk of life or your background or your education <laughs> you could be really selfish um that's right and then you know there was a study in um university of illinois right that that study that came out in so they opened up uh, Urbana Champagne, that campus, mm -hmm. and they had this comprehensive whole thing where kids are tested every day, right, for COVID. Uh, classes are social distance. You know, you're, you're being tracked on your phone, right? So they know where you were, like the most comprehensive COVID preventative system mm -hmm. ever. 
what they didn't think, they didn't think that they would have an outbreak because they didn't take into account that kids would take a test, come out positive and still go to a house party, right? So they had huge outbreaks at this oh. university because kids were testing positive. They didn't care. They still went to the party. They still went to the frat party. They still <laughs> went to the dining hall. They still went to class. Like, you know, so I really, every time, like the more I look at all these different instances, you know, of the pandemic, I'm like, you know, we are <laughs> really selfish. Um, just, I don't, you mean, you're in one of the best schools in the country, right? and you are given all these resources. And in the midst of a pandemic, the school provided a way for you to be educated and go through your school year and you would test positive and go and to a party. <laughs> like, yeah. and this is, this is like, you know, that happened to a lot of people did this. So there were out, outbreaks. Comes out in the news all the time. People yeah. Being selfish, yeah. This one lady being interviewed, not wearing a mask. And said, well, if I'm going to die, I was meant to die anyway or something, you know. But you didn't have to die from the disease and expose everyone meanwhile. You know, yeah. so you were about their thinking, you know, really. I just... this, is, this is where leadership matters, though. Yeah. And, um, you know, unless people are hearing the correct information uh -huh. from somebody that they can trust, um, and we're hearing it, you know, it, it's our, our problem right now is yep. just that we don't have this message from everybody. Our top yeah. leader. And, you want, uh, how, how will they be turned around, even if Biden gets. We're, we're, we, you cannot change some people's minds. I am yeah. convinced of that. But what we can do is show the world, show our country, and show yeah. the world what is possible and um you know we're we're not going to change those folks who are determined to not read to not think for themselves to not uh, who are just going to follow someone yeah. <laughs> um but we can we can turn this around and yeah. i'm you know i am i'm i i, I remain cautiously optimistic yeah, that we, we will come out of it better because yeah. i think we were we didn't understand a lot yeah. of things right right and we didn't understand what we really value either mm -hmm. until yeah. now yeah. Yeah. So that's mm -hmm. my <laughs> that's right. yeah exactly yeah, I think we, I hope so, you know, we know what's important. I think for me, I definitely realize what's important uh, mm -hmm. for me, you know. Mm -hmm. And yeah. we have to just have faith. And we have to have faith yeah. that God is in charge. Right, yeah. Yeah. right, right. So, so again, I say, Pastor, thank you for showing your frailty during the worship service. Yeah. Because then it helps me appreciate the when I feel fear and I just think that I'm the only one having a problem at this no, moment. You're not the only one. No, but but yeah. it just feels that way. Your mind just it just goes in that direction. So we need those reminders and it's through the church, I think. And that's for the sake of our children too, is to set that example, yeah. Because I, I want the children I want to leave them a better world. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, definitely. Faith over fear. I'm sorry? Faith over fear. Yes, faith over fear. Yeah, that's the, oh, that's, that's the lesson for 2020. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Well, we have this, you know, thing that we can fall back on. I worry about exactly. people who don't, exactly. you know, who have no, you know, don't know how to handle this because... Having faith gives me peace. You know, you don't continue worrying and stressing out about it. I said, well, you know, but uh, I feel sorry for people who do not have any faith right. to fall back on. Really. That's right. It should all go by what was supposed. Yes. No mask, no ride, no exception. So yeah. The exceptions for all of us. 
Yeah, definitely. Yeah, well, there's, we definitely can lean back on our faith, and I think mm -hmm. you know if you don't if you don't have that, then it's you know you're yeah. carrying a big load for sure. Mm -hmm. Thank God. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Another Bible Thank study. You. Um, let's close in prayer, and uh, we'll definitely think about you know our country and this pandemic and everything else right now. Dear Lord, uh, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you so much for uh, the message that we have in your scripture, that you stand up to uh, those that were exploiting and hurting people, that you were not afraid to speak your mind and to stand up for what's wrong. You were also um, strong in your convictions, your son, Jesus Christ was strong in conviction, Lord. Um, and we know that the greatest commandment is to love the Lord our God with all our hearts, and love our neighbor as ourselves. I pray that we would live this in everything that we do. Lord, I pray that we would remember that it's not nothing that we can do to earn your favor or your love. It's by your grace, the extravagant gift that you've given us that we have this faith in you and i pray that we continue to rest on that especially in the midst of this pandemic as we're seeing so much unrest as we're seeing uh, people continue to get sick and seeing people not take it seriously as all of us are stuck in our respective homes um, we are also not able to just live the way that we would live normally but i pray that you would guide us through this time help us to see clearer Help us to rest on our faith. And as Mary said, I pray that we would be an example to the world in some way, somehow, um, how to get through this and how to trust in you. So we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good to see you all. Good, night. Good, Good night. to see you. Good night. Good night. Good night, Good night everyone. Good night, everyone. Good night.